Hi, I'm Kenneth Woods. Thank you for joining me for this podcast, part of the 2020 Virtual Colorado Mahler Fest. Beethoven's Third Symphony, the Eroica, might be the most famously revolutionary piece of music ever written. It is not at all unusual for today's commentators to say that when the piece was first performed in Vienna, a little over 200 years ago, that audiences had never heard anything like it. But in fact, many of them had, just in a very different context. It's been known for a long time that when writing his great symphony in E-flat major, Beethoven studied Mozart's own symphony in the same key, his 39th, very carefully. The influence of Mozart's model can be seen in both the melodic use of E-flat major arpeggios, which form the main melodies of the first movements of both works, and in the use of unusually strong dissonant chords, which Mozart uses in the introduction to his symphony's first movement, and which Beethoven uses with much greater vehemence at the climax of the development of his. The emotional arc of the two pieces couldn't be much more different, but the material is very similar in places. Similar instances of homage, modeling, and quotation can be seen in the influence that Mozart's C minor piano concerto had on Beethoven's third piano concerto in the same key. And he also borrowed ideas from composers like Carabini and Haydn. Lest one think that Mozart might have been offended by Beethoven recycling some of his musical ideas, compare the famous opening of his Requiem with Handel's funeral anthem for Queen Caroline, The Ways of Zion du Morne. Though the rhythm of the accompaniment is different, the melody and the chord progression, as well as the funereal atmosphere, are virtually the same. 
and Beethoven would surely have been neither surprised nor offended when Robert Schumann, writing his own symphony in E-flat major, often erroneously called the Rhenish, would subtly reference any number of features from the first movement of Beethoven's third. It has always been one of the jobs of the artists of today to pose the questions that the artists of tomorrow must answer, and also to try to answer the questions posed by their forebears. For a composer like Schumann, answering the questions posed by Beethoven was a challenge he relished. For Schumann's younger protege, Johannes Brahms, the challenge of answering the existential questions posed by the Beethoven symphonies was almost insurmountable. I shall never compose a symphony, Brahms said. You have no idea how the likes of us feel when we hear the tramp of a giant like him behind us. <laughs> We can all take comfort that, in this instance, Brahms didn't keep to his word. Though it took him 17 years, he did finally compose, and complete, a symphony, one that was immediately hailed as not only worthy of comparison with the Nine by Beethoven, but nicknamed the Tenth. Commentators noted a similarity between the hymn-like melody used by Beethoven in his Ode to Joy and the warm theme of the finale of Brahms's first symphony. Any ass can hear that, 
grumbled Brahms when a friend pointed out the similarity. Brahms' offense was probably due to the fact that his contemporaries saw this similarity as simply an homage, or worse yet, as imitation. In fact, for Brahms, it was probably intended more as a critique. Beethoven had invited the human voice into the symphony as a kind of musical last resort. Oh, friends, not these tones, he had said. Rather, let us tune our voices more pleasantly. saw the ninth as a work of genius, but also as a dangerous aberration from the classical model of the symphony. Oh yes, these tones, he is perhaps saying, these are just the tones we need. Let us keep our singing voices quiet and let the orchestra get on with it. Brahms would go on to compose three more symphonies, each less indebted to Beethoven, and each, in its way, more rigorously built on classical ideals. By the time Mahler came to begin his life's work as a symphonist, Brahms, who Mahler met on several occasions, had firmly established himself as the new tramping giant behind the shoulders of the next generation of symphonists. Mahler's first symphony conspicuously quotes a passage from Brahms' Second Symphony, which in turn quotes from Handel's Messiah. That reference is infinitely subtle compared to the similarity between the opening theme of Mahler's Third Symphony and the very tune in Brahms's First that brought so many unwelcome comparisons to Beethoven's Ninth. <laughs> 
you must admit, the similarity is striking. Even an ass can hear that, Mahler might well have said. As with Brahms, such similar music is surely inviting a comparison, perhaps even provoking a debate or posing a new question. In his first symphony, Brahms had taken Beethoven to task for introducing the human voice into his Ninth Symphony, Brahms serving as Zeus, chastising the Promethean figure of Beethoven. Perhaps song, like fire, was meant to belong only to the gods. Brahms, for all he revered Beethoven, steered the symphony firmly back towards its roots in instrumental music. But Mahler, now writing a huge, choral D minor symphony like Beethoven's Ninth, is perhaps saying that the path Beethoven started down is the one he, Mahler, must now follow, and that even Brahms's Apollonian hymn must face the untamed forces of nature and fate which will rage across the 35-minute span of this movement. This is only one of hundreds of examples of Mahler's engagement with the questions posed by his musical forebears. But what questions did Mahler's music ask of the generations of composers who would come after him? Mahler's younger colleague and friend, Arnold Schoenberg, wrote superstitiously after Mahler's death that it seems that the ninth is a limit. He who wants to go beyond it must pass away. It seems as if something might be imparted to us in the tenth, which we ought not yet to know, for which we are not yet ready. Those who have written a ninth stood too close to the hereafter. But what Schoenberg wouldn't fully understand until later in his life was that Mahler had gone beyond the ninth, having more or less completed his tenth symphony in sketch before his death. Perhaps Schoenberg might more accurately have said, it seems Mahler is a limit. To go beyond him requires something we do not yet know, for which we are not yet ready. After all, can one really write anything grander than Mahler's eighth? Can one write anything more harrowing than the sixth? More personal than the ninth? Should one even try? And in all of these works... Mahler is stretching the resources of form, tonality, technique, and instrumentation to their absolute limits. Tellingly, Schoenberg never wrote a full-fledged symphony, but he did write two electrifying chamber symphonies, which sometimes seem like works in which all the drama and intensity of a 100-minute Mahler symphony for a hundred musicians is condensed down to 15 players and 20 minutes. <laughs> 
generation after Mahler, composers tended to either avoid the symphony or to rethink it. There were avowed Mahlerians, like Benjamin Britten, who seemed to accept that Mahler had said everything that could be said about the symphony, while younger members of the Viennese tradition from which Mahler had sprung, like Hans Gall, turned again to Brahms as a role model, embracing a more modest and classical view of the symphony. Gall even looked back to Haydn for inspiration, embracing anew the role of gentle humor in the place of Mahler's dark ironies in the finales of many of Gall's symphonies. Mahler's would-have-been son-in-law, Ernst Krenick, bravely tried his hand at an atonal Mahler symphony, with his nearly hour-long second, but even for aficionados of Krenick's music, including myself, the work, for all its mastery and ambition, remains hard to love. Mahler had taken the symphony so far in one direction that the only way to keep the genre relevant seemed to be to reinvent it. In Britain, Mahler's contemporary, Edward Elgar, had written two of the greatest symphonies of all time, both on a nearly Mahlerian scale, and both grounded almost entirely in the Austro-German traditions of Brahms and Wagner. 
Though Elgar is widely hailed as Britain's greatest composer, there is nothing particularly British in his symphonic vocabulary or technique. It would be his younger countryman, Rafe von Williams, who would radically rethink the sound world of symphonic music on a scale not seen since Beethoven, casting out almost every hint of Germanic influence, replacing it with a musical world rooted in folk song, modal harmony, Revelian orchestral textures, and the vocal melismas of old English choral masters like Thomas Tallis. If Mahler had followed one path to its logical conclusion, then the only way forward for someone like von Williams was to look for other composers for inspiration. It is telling that von Williams dedicated what I think is his greatest symphony, his fifth, to John Sibelius, Mahler's contemporary, and in many ways, his symphonic antipode. For many 20th and 21st century symphonists, Sibelius' ideas about the symphony proved to be a more fruitful foundation on which to build. Even the great Malarian David Matthews, who as a young man was so deeply involved in the revisions of the Cook performing version of Mahler's 10th symphony, has found himself more indebted to Sibelius in his later symphonies, particularly the one movement 7th and the most recent 9th. <laughs> 
mustn't get the mistaken impression that Mahler didn't have a profound influence on the next generations. It is probably more the case that for many composers, he had become the latest tramping giant. Brahms has said that he felt he couldn't write a symphony in the shadow of Beethoven, but he did write in almost every other genre, other than opera, before tackling the symphony, and Beethoven's influence can be seen in pretty much everything he wrote during that time. Likewise, the music of Berg and Schoenberg is hugely influenced by Mahler, even though they avoid his favorite genre. David Matthews' Sibelian Ninth Symphony actually shares the same five-movement structure as Mahler's Seventh and Tenth Symphonies, just on a much smaller time scale. Matthews' entire Ninth Symphony is considerably shorter than the first movement of Mahler's Third. But there will always be composers who, like Mahler and Schumann, are more temperamentally prepared to take up the challenges laid down by their heroes. Dmitry Shostakovich was almost certainly the 20th century symphonist most comfortable with his personal relationship to Mahler's music. Perhaps, like Schumann and Beethoven, Shostakovich could be sanguine about referencing Mahler because his own musical voice is so distinctive. Shostakovich never seemed to have to struggle to avoid sounding like anyone else. Many of Shostakovich's symphonies were shaped by his engagement with Mahler's models and ideas. His death-obsessed song symphony, the 14th, is clearly a bleak counter-argument to Mahler's more hopeful and transcendent Das Lied von der Erde, where Mahler says at the end of his work that everywhere and forever, horizons bright and blue in the distance eternally. Shostakovich quotes Rilke, Death is great. We are his. When our mouths are filled with laughter, when we think we are in the midst of life, he dares to weep in our midst. <laughs> 
Even as Shostakovich repudiates Mahler, one must remember how much he reveres him, just as Brahms had revered Beethoven. And Mahler's influence on Shostakovich is incredibly potent in the epic first movement of Shostakovich's fourth, and even in the ironic Lendler in the second movement of Shostakovich's fifth. Many consider Shostakovich's tenth to be his most perfect symphony, and the first movement in particular shows a great debt to Mahler, not only in its vast structure, but also in its incorporation of the melody of Mahler's Urlicht. The text takes on a dark new resonance in the age of the Stalinist terrors. Der Mensch liegt in größter Not, der Mensch liegt in größter Pein. Man lies in greatest need, man lies in direst pain. 
Perhaps it is thanks to Shostakovich that later generations of Russian composers also seemed less intimidated by Mahler. Alfred Schnitke would seem to have suffered the same Curse of the Ninth as Mahler and Bruckner, leaving a final symphony, number nine, but actually the tenth he had written, incomplete and nearly indecipherable at the time of his death. Schnitke's fifth symphony elaborates a fragment from Mahler's incomplete early piano quartet, but the most Mahlerian of his works might be his string trio, written in memory of Alban Berg, which shows Schnitke's lifelong fascination with the final decades of the Viennese tradition in the years between Mahler and Weber. More recently, Valentin Silvestrov has found inspiration in Mahler, particularly in Silvestrov's Fifth Symphony, a work that is something of a requiem for the age of musical ambition, possibility, and innovation embodied by Mahler. Silvestrov says, with our advanced artistic awareness, fewer and fewer new texts are possible, which, figuratively speaking, begin at the beginning. What this means is not the end of music as art, but the end of music, an end in which it can linger for a long time. It is very much in the area of the coda that immense life is possible. Silvestrov has said that I do not write new music. My music is a response to and an echo of what already exists. In this case, it is very much an echo and a coda to the music of Mahler and his contemporaries. In our own time, Philip Sawyers is a composer who, like Schnitke, is fascinated with the musical legacy of Mahler, Schoenberg, and Berg. But where Schnitke's language is wildly eclectic, Sawyers, like Brahms and Shostakovich, is a composer with a particularly consistent and powerful personal voice. <laughs> 
Sawyer's went so far in the notes to his first symphony as to admit that he wanted to give the musicians playing it an experience with the same kind of dramatic arc as a symphony by Mahler or Bruckner. And the triumphant arrival of the chorale theme at the end of his first symphony is indeed powerfully Brucknerian. Sawyer's second symphony is clearly indebted to Schoenberg's first chamber symphony, itself Schoenberg's answer to Mahler's seventh. And then there is Sawyer's third symphony, an even more Mahlerian work with an adagio with strong thematic connections to the adagio finale of Mahler's ninth. 
Similar? Well, yes, any ass can hear that, Philip might well say. But notice that Sawyers and Mahler take the same melodic gesture to very different places, just as Mahler had taken Brahms's noble hymn theme to a place that Brahms himself would never have imagined. Mahler understood better than any composer before him that the ability to reference well-known musical archetypes could be a powerful form of musical and emotional shorthand. He had a particular gift for taking vernacular styles like dances and marches and reimagining them and stretching them. His tragic sixth symphony is dominated in particular by marches in the outer movements. But while the familiar march rhythm immediately evokes a familiar mood of the pounding footsteps of war, Mahler takes the listener on a completely novel an incredibly epic journey. The humble march was never before or since stretched to such a breaking point. Later this week, you'll have a chance to hear Philip Sawyer's symphonic poem, Homage to Kandinsky. Much as Mahler VI evokes the mood of the military march to great and very innovative effect, in places one might get the feeling that Sawyer's is doing the same thing with the mood of Mahler VI, after a hundred years, now itself a powerful musical touchstone. 
In his most recent symphony, the fourth, Sawyers has brought our discussion full circle, looking back to the work with which we started, Beethoven's Eroico. Sawyers himself says at the opening of the adagio finale of the symphony that the final adagio begins as a funeral march in a solemn D minor. The timpani rhythm borrows the semiquaver rhythm of the Eroica's slow movement, the famous Marcia Funebra, or Funeral March. <laughs> 
After a climax, the music subsides and two new melodies are introduced. One on solo flute, then taken up by the solo oboe, the other on the violins. The funeral triplet rhythm and motif returns fortissimo in brass and percussion, counterpointed with thematic lines in woodwinds and strings. Beethoven's March of Funebra is a work whose bleak fatalism is not far from that of Shostakovich's 14th Symphony. There is no redemption, no salvation, no transformation. Only loss and despair. Here, Sawyer's raises the intensity of this material to truly Mahlerian heights of anguish. However, where Beethoven sinks ever deeper into a vortex of grief and loss, Sawyer's adagio eventually takes a more hopeful turn. Sawyer says of this, a ritardando takes us to the long-awaited D major for the first time. The serene string melody makes its way through sharps, naturals, and flats to finally encompass all 12 semitones of the chromatic scale. To me, this stunning passage is one of the most Malarian Philip has written not because it is in any way similar to any melody in the Mahler symphonies, 
but because of the delicately ecstatic emotional atmosphere it conveys. In its tenderness and fragility, it reminds me of the remarkable flute melody from the finale of Mahler's tenth and final symphony. When Mahler brings back that melody at the end of the tenth, what was once almost infinitely fragile has become radiantly impassioned. This love song is the answer to the crisis expressed in the crushing dissonance of the first movement and the harrowing images of death evoked in the opening bars of Mahler's finale. In Philip's fourth, this breakthrough moment takes a work which has been almost entirely dark on an upward journey. The composer himself 
describing the final pages as bringing together all the musical ideas of the movement, indeed the symphony, now transformed by the major key, the music's profound tensions in the composer's words are fully resolved in a glorious, pure D major at the very end. It's the same glorious D major one hears at the end of the adagio finale of Mahler's third symphony. And you might even detect that the trombone chord, just a few bars before the end of the symphony, is the exact same D major voicing used by Brahms just a few bars before the end of his second symphony. Well, Philip might say, surely any ass can hear that.